Well, welcome kids to the wonderful world of Wednesday Wham! We got a full house tonight, folks. Look at this. Everybody showed up. Mm-hmm. Brief. Good evening. Brief Break that got, down. Wow. Scott, <laughs> that we got like Scott Wakefield. We've got Aaron. We've got Rob. We've got Jeremy in the house tonight. Rory Boyle and Barb, the Empress of the Inks herself, Kelberg. Uh, welcome, guys, and welcome to you. Before we get started, I want to thank our uh, sponsors, as we always do, Daytona Beach Comic Convention and uh, the new Orlando Collector Deviants, also a sponsor. And a, a special thanks, as always, to Kablam Printing, who does the spectacular work printing our books. Um, Scott, how you doing, man? Good to hey. see you. Good to be here. I was sorry, just uh, sharing on the socials, trying to get that out there. I was listening. I, I really, honest, Dean. I was, I was listening. <laughs> yeah, sure. That's okay. That's all right. We're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna have a good show tonight. We've got a combination of academic discussion blended with uh, a silly pop culture reviews later in the show, as we always do. I like to have a little bit of something for everyone. Our main focus is going to be the uh, show and tell. The art of a dialogue, exposition, and of course, art. And how much is too much is kind of what we're going to focus on, which might make this a little bit more of a, of a writer heavy show um, or a heavy writer show, yeah. as we said earlier. Who's a heavy writer? Yeah, well, we, should, we don't name names here, kids. But uh, well, before we get on started, a diet now. yeah, <laughs> I should be. Um, let's start with you, Scott. Just uh, give everybody, you know, the quick uh, one-line intro, uh, and we'll go. We'll go around the room here. Uh, hey, you first. Go. I'm Scott Wakefield. I'm the co-creator, co-writer of Steam Patriots. Issue number one's out there. Issue number two. I can't say just as around the corner, but it's coming. It's coming. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And uh, that's me. Good deal. Good deal. Uh, Rory, what about you, my friend? Oh, Introduce hello. yourself. Here's a story. Uh, co-creator, Steve <laughs> Patriots. <laughs> Chris, uh, Wakefield here. And uh, you said we're not making good headway on um, number two. I think it's. Well, we're... I didn't say that. I said it's not oh. around. The... I don't want. I don't want people to think, think it's right. I'm going like, to set a bar. I'm going like, to set a bar high. To... You guys are going to see it real soon. Okay. It's around the block. Bold. <laughs> it's, it's around the block. <laughs> it's down the corner, around the corner. If you cross the bridge, <laughs> next to Aunt Emma's house by the big tree. Yeah. Yeah. It's always <laughs> around buried, buried buried underneath it. You've gone you too far. <laughs> now, if you hit the white so, fence with the grips. <laughs> well, uh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Rory and Scott Barb. Uh, introduce yourself. One liner, two liners. <laughs> Barb Kelberg. Um, a long time inker. Um, I'm inking for Silverline now. I'm also coloring, which I'm doing as we talk. Oh, uh, and I'm also the creator and co writer, inker and colorist on my own book, the award winning Divinity, which number Indeed. three, the number three is in progress. So I'm working Good on deal. It. We're looking forward to it. Jeremy, introduce yourself. I must. Um, Jeremy Kahn? Doing a digital coloring for a bunch of different titles. Uh, right now, I'm going to be hopefully finish up the Cray cover soon. That's all well, I love is two covers for that. Uh, other than that, I've also started up some um, uh, online streaming for my coloring. So check it out at uh, Twitch at Joint Paint. You know, that's oh, cool. it. Fantastic. Looking forward to that. And another comics veteran, Mr. Rob Davis. How are you, sir? I'm doing all right. I am Rob Davis for Silverline Comics. I did. The pencil and inks on Twilight Grimm. Uh, I'm also the art director, chief cook and bottle washer uh, for Airship 27 Productions, uh, which is a pulp revival uh, publisher. I do illustrations and the design work for them. And probably what I'm best known for is in the 1990s, I worked on Star Trek books for both Malibu and D.C., Oh, yeah, we remember those well. And finally, last but not least, Aaron Humphreys. What's up, my friend? Arum. Nothing much. Arum. <laughs> I'm, I, I draw Arum stuff, as you can see. Um, yeah, yeah. I, uh, the Pencil and Fire Rush in the upcoming Obsoletes. Um, I finished my comic yesterday, Goblins. Yay! Awesome! Yay. So that Congrats. whole thing is done. So, awesome. yeah, so I'm designing the last cover now and then. And then it's in the bag. 
Fantastic. So, Fantastic. Yeah, nice and I'm your host, Dean Zachary. I've done uh, the reboot uh, issue number one of Cat and Mouse for Silverline and several covers for the current Silverline title stable and also working on the upcoming Silverblade. So now that all the uh, table has been set, let's dive right into our subject tonight. Okay, let's go with, uh, start with the writer here, Mr. Scott Wakefield. You knew I was going to pick on you first, right? You, you had to know this. Um, let's talk, oh, let's talk about uh, dialogue. Let's talk about exposition. Um, how much is too much? And, and let, let's start with uh, exposition first. Ooh, okay, um, and I have, let's I have talk about that. Strong feelings on that, especially if we're talking about dialogue. Okay. Dialogue, I feel. This is a Scott Wakefield statement. This is a Scott mm -hmm, Wakefield mm -hmm. feeling, and this is what sure. Scott Wakefield likes. Mm -hmm. Because this whole subject, we could just say, well, if you like it, you know, we, we can end it there. It's, <laughs> if you like it, then it's good. Scott right. Wakefield right. talks about himself in the third person. <laughs> in the third person, much like Dr. Doom. Scott, <laughs> Scott says, <laughs> and I feel uh, exposition in almost every case, if you can find a way to trim it down to its minimal, 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 minimal -ness, mm -hmm. is, mm -hmm. it is what you should do. Now, I, I you read old books and they're full of exposition. I like old books, but like mm -hmm. I think we mentioned, sure. like, try to read Nathaniel Hawthorne or like House of the Seven Gables or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It just goes on and on and on sure. and nothing happens. And that's all good and fine. Um, mm -hmm. But especially in the comic book world where we want to keep a pace, exposition. And again, this is my feeling. This is what I try to do. Exposition can be handled by dialogue. Yes. I love, love, love dialogue because you can impart so much information with one line. You could have, you know, you could describe somebody as a, some, you know, a gangly, awkward teenager with this hair and that. You, or you could have someone say, well, oh, he's a funny looking kid. You know, you could and you leave it at that. And we do have the beauty of visual elements in comic books, but when you can describe, or oh, man, I had a rough day in dialogue rather than saying, Joe got to work late and stepped in a mud puddle and his tie got caught in the printer. And mm -hmm. you could say that later if it adds to the story, but I really, really feel like in the writing realm and when you're writing prose, comics, anything, if you can eliminate exposition, do it. If you can eliminate it and replace it with action, do it. And I, I do, I'm of the camp, I feel dialogue is action. Something is happening. People are talking. So mm -hmm. I love dialogue. And if I can tell a story with dialogue, I, I try to do that. Not all the time, but that is my, that is, that's my, that is my method, I guess. So it's your modus operandi. Yes. Thank mm -hmm. you, Rob. That mm -hmm. is the way I like to tell stories. I love using dialogue now now do you have uh, in your mind now the reason i'm asking this is that uh, i use a software uh, called a uh, final draft mm -hmm. uh the 12th iteration and there's a, a graphic novel template in there and as you're going yeah. through it it gives you some recommendations on writing uh each panel to panel uh, and it says that it's recommended between 25 and 35 words and i had never read it quantified okay. so succinctly and exactly in your head do you have like a word count going on or is it an instinctual thing you know i i read it out loud and that's something i recommend to everybody who writes anything yep. uh, before it goes to mm -hmm. uh, a proofreader or an editor especially a proofreader uh, again anything <laughs> read it out loud because mm -hmm. you'll feel the pacing now a comic book i think needs the the beats a little more even more you know where do you where do you break the the, the bubbles or mm -hmm. where do you stop and maybe do a page turn? Reading it out loud, I, I think really helps with, with the rhythm, <clears throat> the flow and the natural, mm -hmm. if someone were to make a, a stop or an interruption. Um, now, mm -hmm. as far as count, that, that a lot of times comes to a visual thing because if there's balloons start filling up the, the panel and yeah, you run out of space. True. Now, sometimes that, that actual, that might be a visual element in and of itself because you've got somebody really like, blabbering on like me you know if this was a comic book it'd just be all words in front of me and you'd see my eyes or something so um that might actually fit but a lot of times because you want the art to show through if you uh, an economy of words i think is necessary except for sometimes those cases where you you do want you you want a little extra and i, I feel like it falls into the visual sense but that's that's me. That's my that's my that's my feeling on the whole the whole question. Well, that sounds good. That sounds good. It's a it's a balanced take, being reasonable and uh, 
be, being, uh, well, let's say aware of how much dialogue and less exposition, more exposition hidden and hinted at within the dialogue. If you, if you can. Sometimes if you it's, can. Not, it's not uh, even, I like captions. Um, I mm -hmm. kind of, I kind of like the thought balloons sometimes, but I know that's kind of fallen out of fashion. So mm -hmm. it's moved into the caption world. And the yeah, purpose, again, if you can just, if you can tell, say later or meanwhile, mm -hmm. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. so much more than down the road and across the street and over the, sure. the bridge. Um, <laughs> and that's, yeah. that's, but sometimes every once in a while, a little bit of, a little bit of flowery, exposition is good but again read it out loud find the pacing and see how it feels in the big picture with with and a variation too i uh, i like a variation of in in any writing sentence structure you know long and shorts um to, to keep a a, a a pace going so it doesn't become tedious or ponderous like again the sound of my voice here so i'm makes gonna, sense. I'll pass it off. makes sense as as he rambles on Thank no you. it's it's okay it's all right rory uh we're gonna segue to you because uh you and scott work together on steam patriots uh, and other things so how do you feel about it? do you take this judicious approach of balancing uh, exposition within the dialogue uh how do you feel about all this i think balance is subjective i think it depends on what type of story you're writing. Is it a, a slow slink in the shadow of political espionage with a little bit of action, you know, at the climax? Or is it a story type that is every actionable item is what drives the story forward? Or is it knowledge based? It's the coming to a conclusion of something that pulls you along through the story. Uh, and you can depending on how you write the story is how you would weight it, how you would balance it. Mm -hmm. So if you're visually pacing the story, that's one thing, because I think mm -hmm. if that's your main focus, the dialogue has to follow that. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to overload it if it's if you're more visual. Um, I think like in when you're making film, you have to show more than you discuss. What like Scott said, you think dialogue drives story, and it, it does. But it's usually always accompanied with the action if somebody says they're going to do something, then they have to do it. So and, it's, and it's like an audience. Oh, good. Saying dialogue, though, too much, like the, 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 the uh, what's his name? Um, Quentin Tarantino. Some, mm -hmm. of the, some of the, what's the one with the girls that drive the stunt car? It's in the grindhouse. Death so, proof. The, is it death proof or is it the other one? Is that it's death thing? proof. Death, it's it, death proof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she drives the barracuda, the white barracuda. Somebody's stepping on the hood. Yes. <laughs> Okay. What's yeah. the one where, what's his name, drives the other car, the Nova, and slams into the other? That Jason Statham's one, right? No. no. Anyways. No, that, was, that was Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell drives Kurt the Russell. car and slams into the front of the other cars. That's not death proof? Or they're both death proof? That's, that's death proof. The, the it is. It's Death Proof. The, the other name is Planet Terror. It's Planet Terror and Death Proof. The two movies and, in And they're both house. in this. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. So the scene the, where they're in the diner, just blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, 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 blah. Sure. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. Like, mm -hmm. get on with it. That yeah. That's an example of too, way too much dialogue. So, okay. Sorry. You know, okay. So, I was like, like thinking the uh, the restaurant scene in Inglorious Bastards where he's can't eating. Say that. It's with an E. It's with an E. It's from. Oh, thank you. <laughs> the where he's eating that dessert. Wow. It's Turd. like the okay. most degrading yeah. thing because the use of sound. I and mean, you can't mm -hmm. do that in a comic book. That's an interesting Yeah. Thing. Well, um, so, okay, never mind. Beats. Uh, I, I probably brought up David Mamet bemoaning the fact that on a, a, a stage you can't smoke anymore because yeah. <laughs> in dialogue he – He'd, he'd throw a cigarette in there mm -hmm. because it gives the the actor, especially on stage, something yeah. to do to mm -hmm. give a pause instead of just standing there. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives him something to do. I, I think it's – anyways, that's a uh, – David Mamet uses tons of dialogue. If you watch Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, I don't know if who's – Sure. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah. one of my – my wife hates that movie. She and I are pretty <laughs> much on par with most movies. She's like, this is the dumbest, worst movie ever because nothing happens <laughs> in it. It's like a nothing <laughs> – it's all people yeah. talking. But I love it. I love well, it. Like mm -hmm. Death of a Salesman isn't, isn't like that. Yeah. Exactly. Just a mm -hmm. lot, a lot. Too, but, it's, mm -hmm. but it's really heartfelt, and it tells a story. You don't need exposition. Um, in uh, in um, Glenn Gary Glenn Ross, you know, 
it's it opens with um jack lemon there on the phone in the rain he's like you know oh sorry honey i almost had him i almost had him you know and he's like you know exactly what's going on yeah. You get oh yeah because he's on the phone and he's talking that's one i love this one of my go-to's for for dialogue i love that movie <laughs> dialogue does reveal character yeah roy yeah. were you were you uh in the yeah. middle of something or okay go ahead. Uh, if you're if you can plan it, your story out enough that you have themes or motifs and you have to repeat something either a color a scene or a phrase so you're going to have to lean heavier one way or the other depending on what you want to get across and my my final point is to nuance it all montages fix everything <laughs> the training the montage. montage. Yeah. It training all montage. goes back to the training Travel. montage from Rocky. <laughs> and then the oh, freeze boy. frame. Right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The freeze frame. There's no exposition there. Right. You don't right. need it. Just, just I mean, up, right? problem solved. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> problem solved. Excellent point. Barb, what, what about you? How do you feel about, you know, you're, you're getting sort of more into the writing, even though you're more the plot. Uh, and storytelling in this case, but um, I'm sure that even as you're working on the plot side of things, you've got to think about you know how much dialogue is going to be here and where and where is it going to go. Yeah. I was going to start out by saying I cheat, but that isn't exactly true. <laughs> I, I cheat by turning over my by turning over all my notes and plots and everything to R. A. Jones, and then he scripts it, so he's an expert at that. Mm -hmm. But that's not exactly true because. Um, for instance, we're in the middle of doing uh, issue three, so that's all plotted out and four is plotted out. But I'm I'm just gotten into plotting out the next arc. Okay. And um, and I realized that at the beginning of the next arc, issue five, we have to kind of catch up because we're we're moved past and we've we've had a little time jump. Okay. Now, you could sit around and do Wally Wood's 22 uh, panels that always work, mm -hmm. but yep. that's pretty boring. And I, I don't like a lot of uh, exposition, but in the case of the beginning of issue five, I found it necessary to at least catch people up a little bit and to talk about their plans uh, to escape notice. So what I did was I I'm I have a very short attention span. So I I did it the way that I would want to see it to keep my interest. And um so while the adults are talking in the foreground and they kind of fade into the foreground and they have the word balloons, we see divinity in the background and she's doing something in the background. So while we're reading the exposition She's digging through uh, Olivia's bag and coming up with, you know, her bras and you know, <laughs> a copy, a copy of uh, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey and stuff which she should not be getting into, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But but this this gives you um, something to focus on while the adults are talking in the background. Got it. So that's kind of a trick that works. Is that instead of just having boring dialogue between two people, keep something going mm -hmm. uh, as mm -hmm. you're, as you're catching people up. So that was my idea. Um, Cause I felt that I wanted to get while the, while the adults are doing the focus is supposed to be on divinity for the, for the most part. So I, I put it there and she's uh, she's misbehaving. Um, I, I like that yes. idea. I, yeah. I like that. That's a, yeah. that's a very uh, a efficient cheap. use of time and space uh, there in, in your storytelling because you're doing two things at once. You're basically doing previously in divinity mm -hmm. as you're moving forward with her silent action. And then the dialogue is covering previously on, how do you and, feel about that in terms of a previously, do you, do you like that with actually having a previously in page that catches everyone up or would you rather it be more organically blended into the story itself? I well, the the exposition isn't really previously on, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here's where we're at. We're stuck out in the middle of X, and in order to get to the Z, we need to do this, this, and this. Okay. Um. 
So, you know, like we need to ditch the credit cards and we need to, you know, uh, take all the money out of our credit or our, our banking accounts and stuff like that. We need to get rid of some logical steps before we move into, into the whole action. Because people are going to gonna find your plot holes mm -hmm. if you don't do certain mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to become obvious why they have to do this stuff later on. So you have to set it up. Sure. You know, there's, there's things that you have to set up in order for the people to understand why you're doing some of the things you're doing or why things happen the way they happen. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes it's not always exciting. So I thought to throw in a little everyday montage, you know, a little slice of life, um, funny thing to not, mm -hmm. only, to not only break the tension, but to break the boredom of an exposition. Yeah, we used to do that in, in the 90s. We called it shootout in a strip club. But, you know, that's... <laughs> <laughs> uh, you would do that, you know, just non sequitur. Let's do this next scene, right. which is a boring conversation, and have it in a strip club. You right. know? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. That's what, Absurd. Yeah. I prefer, the, <laughs> I, I I prefer that... the, tried and, the tried and true it's, method it's, of okay, now I can't hear. having two people talk and say everything to each other that they should already know. I like that. I like when, no. when, when someone tells the other guy, well, when you crashed the car last week, I like that. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's always good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the, the tried and true introducing the new guy. You got all. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Yep. So Aaron, what about you, my friend, when you're writing stuff, do you want to have more dialogue and exposition less? How do you balance it all out? I think it just depends on what I'm doing in the scene. Okay. I have right. conversations that last up to eight, nine pages. <laughs> right. And, uh, but I want you to pay attention to them. Right. Um, and so I will concentrate, I will break the dialogue down. So each panel is a form of acting. Okay. So instead of showing somebody just sitting there like a head and just spewing a bunch, I break a lot of it down by sentence by sentence. So you see how a person reacts mm -hmm. and is responding to the information given to them, if that makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I don't, I, I, I don't think I don't, I don't think a lot of comic book artists use facial expressions as much as they should. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I did. Well, I try to put pauses in the my in my conversations too. Yeah. They have maybe three expressions they can draw. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's part. Of, that's yeah, part yeah. of it. <laughs> yeah, it's it's how good they are at doing expressions. Richard Richard Dunn yeah. says. Uh, I can imagine that Steam Patriots is going to have a ton of that type of combined <laughs> action dialogue with Felix in the background and soldiers arguing in the foreground. Uh, Guys, uh, writers of Steam Mr. Pats. Richard Dunn, VIP, Steam VIP. Patriots fan. Um, uh -huh. uh, soldiers don't argue. They shoot each other. Um, so. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice one. Yeah, nice they one. burp. They fart. They, they scratch themselves. <laughs> they they behind the, the tents. You know, there's um, all kinds of things yet, that you can be doing. Uh, uh, Mr. Richard Dunn, yes. The, the, we will be mixing up, of course. We've got to have Felix doing stuff and, and, and war happening or Felix... You know, if he's if he's you know with the uh, the Americans the the colonials, uh, mm -hmm. I think he'll. The, the, we've got to mix it up because we do have to tell a story. And so, um, if you read number one, which I know you did, uh, oh, yeah. number two has to have a moment where we catch our breath. And um, but the, we we do like Brian and I both. We've we've, we've paced it out. Mm -hmm. We like we like mm -hmm. we like the highs and lows. And mm -hmm. uh, and like Aaron was saying. Um, dialogue and i do like that the, the thing is though is like when you're when you're paying an artist <laughs> you, <laughs> you can only afford so many panels so when you want to have a great conversation where it's like the 180 turns or or a blank panel where there's a reaction you can do those but sometimes you're like okay we can't take up the rest of this comic we got to get to the, <laughs> right. the big scene so yeah there's got to be a balance always a balance but and we're i think we're all we're all kind of saying the same thing like it's got to fit it's if, if yeah, you it's got to fit if you need it punchy and short or if you need to to slow things down <laughs> Um, it's got to fit. Sometimes we've got a Rory it. message here. It? Oh man, you we've got Rory fans in the house here. Watkins, oh, Watkins yes, actually, Scott, uh, this was your replacement when you, when you left me. Aha, uh -huh. ah, yeah. indeed, B Buffalo. All right, yeah, okay, yeah. that's all that's right. Cool. I, that's very cool. Thanks, it's good that you guys are listening. Um, so Jeremy's back, a perfect time. Uh, Jeremy, how do you feel about dialogue and exposition? Um, I know your specialty is color, but I'd love to hear you weigh in on this as well. 
Yeah, um, first of all, sorry about that. My headset just died. Well, yes. Yeah, so, actually, what the, the example was um, for the my own comic book that I'm writing. Um, um, one of the main scenes I have is you have this alien character who's basically going over this plan to solve a problem with this other character. They're inside this big laboratory. Uh, the problem is the entire plan is her explaining how she's going to do it. It's so basically all a bunch of techno babble, and you know, basically explaining everything with nonsensical words. Mm-hmm. And since it goes on for a good page or two, I had to figure out a way to basically not make it look boring, you know, as a character is basically sitting at a computer explaining to another one. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. a good way I have it uh, to go about this was I basically decided to have a lot of visual elements going around at the same time to balance the um, boring text. So like the other character, his main trait is that he's one of these, like, he's like a straight man character in a comedy routine. So the entire time he's freaking out and, you know, he's really um, just reacting to the situation at hand. Like she's trying to uh, calmly um, explain everything. So I had that, you know, comedic element balancing out the, uh, the comedic visual element balance, balancing out the more straight, boring type text. So I try to get that back right. balance between the two. I like that. Yeah, it's a good solution. Rob, um, what about you, my friend? Dialogue, less, more. How do you feel um, about it when you're, when you're reading a comic? When I'm reading a comic... Uh, I like a good I like a good balanced mix of both. I, mm-hmm. There are times when a good caption that goes beyond what could be shown in the picture kind of explains what's going on. Maybe even gives some of the uh, the emotion behind what's going on, other than what the, the is seen in the one scene. Because you in a comic book, a lot of your action happens in between the panels happens in the gutter. So, and there's only so much you can do in the art and so much you can do it. So you need a little, a good balance of both. Now I've worked on books. Of course, Star Trek is mostly dialogue. There's (laughs) not that. So uh, you learn the, the tricks on how to make that happen. Like that, like what Barb was talking about. If it, even if it's not in the script, you come up with something for the for the characters to do that's mm-hmm. logical visually mm-hmm. while they're talking. You know, if they're you know if they're sitting at a table, maybe they're drinking uh, Earl Grey tea hot or something. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. and they're putting you know. So you have to have them doing things, but uh, uh, for the most part, I, I, there, it has to be the beats. There's beats in a story. It, it, what kind of song are you trying to to compose? with what you're writing. It, so it's it's the beats. There will be times when the dialogue is real short and choppy. And mm-hmm. other times when it's when there's a there's a slow emotional piece in, in there. So you, you you know it'll be either a big panel with a lot of dialogue in it or it, it, some or it's a or it can be all told in, in the pictures. But uh, I, a, a good balance and again it's it's what you're trying what kind of story you're trying to tell. And what kind of music right. you're trying to make with the visuals and the and the words? So yeah, that makes sense. Makes sense. Paige Higgins says, "Howdy, Paige. y'all." Paige, Paige is howdy. A, Paige, Paige is a international Steam Patriots super fan. Hi, Paige. <laughs> and and oh, now she is national. So wow, very <laughs> nice. She's here on the, on the on our shores. Very good. Very good. Oh, she's going to appear. No, no, no. Uh, she is here. She is here. On, oh, on she, our, has appeared. On our, she has on appeared. She has appeared. The beautiful shores of of, of, of of freedom in America. Very nice. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Um, one one thing I haven't heard anyone talk about is the art blending with exposition and dialogue. And one of the uh, devices that I'll use very often, if you have two characters and they're going back and forth, and it's a very uh, shall we say dialogue heavy scene is I'll do a very large panel. I've even done this as a page before <clears throat> where you have, you know, each character on a side, each side of the page and it's just a splash. And then you have their dialogue back and forth, back and forth, like running in between them, um, which gives you that splash, yeah. splash look. So you've got something to look at, but then you can quickly read through that dialogue. Um, have you ever, tr- you've done that one too, I'm sure, Rob, as well. Um, I think yeah. that works 
to keep it interesting, to have a, have a nice splash page. The other device I haven't heard anyone mention yet is uh, what I call uh, cross-cutting, which is incorrect really, but you'll see what I mean when I describe it. And that is when the exposition and dialogue has nothing to do with what you're showing. Barb, Barb sort of touched on this, and uh, some of the more uh, high-minded literary writers uh, do this a lot, like Alan Moore and, and Morrison does it a little bit too. But yeah, they, they'll yeah. have, yeah, so, they'll have, to, they'll have two characters stop talking, and then a completely unrelated visual spectacle unfolding. I thought you just told Scott to stop talking. <laughs> no, no, stop no, no, talking. No, 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 no. no. Uh, the wrong emphasis on the wrong syllable. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that was good. No, was good we may get there eventually, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but, uh, but not at this time. Um, have you guys noticed that? Like, they'll have you ever thought about doing that, Scott? Like, you'll have, you know, the dialogue back and forth, but then something completely unrelated individuals. Maybe even happening, like in your case, it would be the Redcoats would be doing something as the dialogue between our leading mm. colonial characters unfolds above the action yeah i i have i have thought and you know actually i don't know if i've employed that i'm kind of thinking i we may have in a that what do you call it when when the audio starts before you know like right, they start yeah. talking to this and then the video the same, you know that, right. the same thing like cross whatever you call it mm -hmm. um we we've talked about that where where the, the dialogue or the stock starts yeah when the image doesn't match and then like a page right. turn that um we kind of we thought about doing it if people read number one. The final page, uh, the page turn is almost a mirror. Felix is saying the same thing as his dad is. We thought about doing, but it, it was confusing visually. That did just did that. That's maybe a good example. We we tried it. We put the word balloon there. We tried doing like a to Felix's mouth and off the page, like his dad saying the same thing, and mm -hmm. it, it didn't work. So we we just had them both. Like you read it once, okay, turn it. Oh, his dad yeah. is doing the the same thing as, as he is, and because we don't want to give like the exact impression that it's happening at the same moment, but the same mm -hmm. same thing happened. Correct. Uh, you can't use the comedic effect very well, I think. Jeremy, you I've, you got to move a little closer. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I'm saying perfect. you can use it for comedic effect as well. Like, look at the old Rocky and Blowwinkle shorts where the narrator oh. is describing oh. the scene. Yes. What's yeah. going on the pan? Uh, the the episode. Perfect. It has nothing to do with it. Right. And the characters and then they react to one another. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we we're not gonna put a lot of rocking bullwinkle esque comedy in, oh, in this one. <laughs> Maybe we'll do the spin off, the uh <laughs> the comedy one off in, in another universe. <laughs> Fractured fairy yeah, everybody's got jokes. <laughs> yeah, you're talking yeah. about you're talking about uh your characters talking about something while visually it's meanwhile over yeah. here. Yeah type yeah. of yeah. thing. I, I like that. Uh yeah, that type that's of storytelling. Nice, yeah, that's a nice it's technique. A, I like it too. I like when I like, I like it, it when I see it in a book. Then you Especially the fun, when it's, um, what, Go ahead, Jeremy. Was, oh yeah, I was thinking to the cartoon stuff. We have another fun one where um, you know, you're working the exposition into the dialogue naturally. And basically, I basically think of the Poochie scenario, where basically you have the characters over explaining something to make the <laughs> reason for something existing make sense. You know, you know, as the viewer, you know, that doesn't make sense. But since they're saying it has to. Correct. How, how do you guys get around the whole uh, exposition and, and long winded dialogue in the middle of a fight scene? <laughs> re re rewrite. Just, just, just throw rewrite. it all away. That drives rewrite. me crazy. You don't have time to, to sit there and oh, shit post oh, about, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, to your to your villain while you're hitting him. You just have to yeah. taunt. Just you can only use taunts in fight scenes. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> okay. Now there you are know, certain comics you can get away with it. I think you know, like Deadpool, for example, could just freeze the entire panel and just fuck <laughs> over it. <laughs> yeah. that is Absolutely. True. That is true. Now the, you could if. It depends on how you write it, because if you you could do like like a caption as an afterthought, or if you you can always what's what's cool about comic books too is you can you can bend time a little, is you can have your character thinking about something, and that bleeds over into that fight while the fight is happening, and they they've thought about it then this is happening now, but the thought the thoughts are coming up, or if it is in a retrospect. 
you can throw a caption in because because and that works in comic books. It does. I don't know if it works in any other medium unless you do like a voiceover in a movie. But um, yeah, well, well, thought is fast as fast as you can think it, but. It's it's like the old time comic books where yeah, Superman yeah. is is talking to the villain <laughs> as he's as he's pounding him. It's like, why are you yeah. doing that? That's not real life. Mm-hmm. You don't mm-hmm. have time to, to you know to have Half this long Iron exposition. Man have some good conversations while they pound the crap out of each other. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, as far as modern writers, uh, Bendis it does a lot of dialogue during fights, and I think the way they handle it is. Bendis will write all this quippy back and forth dialogue. Let's say if, you know, if, if uh, Iron Man is quipping against the villain he's fighting or Spidey is, and they'll do a montage one page fight, which I, I've, I've always thought that was kind of a cheat because I like long action sequences. But a lot of times these days, they'll just do a one page fight scene where you'll just have a collage of entanglements between the hero and the villain a montage (laughs) indeed and then you'll have staggered quips as you know cascading down the page as the two characters are are entangled and that's a style it's not Mm -hmm. my particularly favorite style like the more classic uh, spider-man style where spidey's thinking usually things yeah. like ouch that hurt you know <laughs> like I, yeah. I i've just run out of webbing I'm, right. I'm, I'm in big trouble you know my arm just went numb i don't think i can you know get through this fight without you know i'm gonna have to find another way to take him out that kind of thing uh, and then the fight actually usually had a two or three page um context to it you know it, it would go on for a while but it always led to something uh, and that was always fun for me, being a fan of, of action comics uh, in general, you know, the more action scenes. But storytelling action always uh, fascinated me more so than just, oh, it's a fight montage. It's almost like Bendis or these current modern writers just go, uh, fight montage page. And I'll write all these quips that they say to each other during the fight. Right. You know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't mind uh, short little quips because you're going to. Sure. You're going to talk turkey, you know, back and forth. Yeah, trash talk. You're going to trash talk talk a little bit. But, you know, these long expositions, like, I found you by going into the library and discussing (laughs) and and tracking your movements through the county court, you know, while while they're sitting Mm -hmm. here. You know, and one of of them was was telling them how they figured out. The twirling... Crawling mustache villain yeah. Yeah. selling villain, his, yeah. Yeah, the, the villain exposition, yeah. <laughs> no, right, Mr. Bond, right. expect him to die. <laughs> right, yeah. Mr. Bond, right. Right, that whole thing. Well, we had what, to work you Bond want... in, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Wait, oh, what, yeah, too. Yeah. Villain speech, yeah. look up Radigan from uh, Great Master Tech. Yeah, the the oh, yes. Wait, who's that, James? Yes. Radigan from the Great Mouse Detective. Oh, if you've never <laughs> seen that, it's a that fantastic. A, that's a yep, cartoon. yep, an underrated. Yes. Yeah, uh, not like Very the Black watchable. Cauldron, which is one of the worst Disney that, that oh makes, my gosh. Uh, movie. Oh no, it's no, a classic. No. When's the last time you watched it, Rory? When Black Cauldron six. is <laughs> the book is amazing. The Disney movie is. I'll have to rewatch it. It good. makes zero sense. I, I, <laughs> it's it's like they needed to make a movie fast, and they they made that. Yeah, sorry, that was, was a, one of the on Sunday the night movies. Oh no, I know which book you're talking about. I have them. Oh, I love the yeah. I love the Lloyd Alexander books, but yeah, that Black Cauldron Disney movie is no, it was poorly. It's done. on Disney. Like I couldn't, I hadn't seen it since I was a kid. It was on Disney Plus. I'm like, oh hey, oh my goodness, mm-hmm. what a weird, <laughs> weird movie. And it's like they just chopped, like they ran out of time and chopped things out, and like it, it is, it is a weird, weird. Lloyd Alexander's a weird looking guy. <laughs> I don't wow. know what it looks like. Okay, no, stop no, it. No Gurgi fans. No Gurgi fans. Okay. Who? Gurgi. Oh, the dog the, from Black that that thing, yeah, that yes. yeah. What the, is he? Eating? He's like a snarf or a I don't know. A <laughs> golem. It's their, it's their version of golem is weird. Yeah. It's all weird. <laughs> <laughs> it's very strange. Okay, so what about how much art do you guys want to see on a page? Like I've I've recently seen a graphic novel where there was so much dialogue, literally. <laughs> It looked like, you know, postage stamps underneath all the, the dialogue balloons. So, like, that, you know, not a fan of that. Um, unless you're going to go, like, I've seen that done before where 
it's heavy dialogue, heavy exposition. And then the next page is like a huge double <coughs> splash with nothing. Right. So if you're going to do, you know, tension release like that, I'm OK with that if it's done, you know, to taste. Um, but wh- how do you guys feel about just art? Like there's there's a lot of purists out there who are like, you know what? You should be able to understand the entire comic with not one word in it. And so. There is some truth to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, no, yeah. but not the entire. Co- I don't think that would work for an entire. Comic no, book. actually, I. I'm inclined to be being a writer. I feel like if you can script it well enough, being a writer, not not mm-hmm. being able to draw, I feel well, strongly that. <laughs> I, you know, if, if you can script, like if you're telling a story, if you're telling a story just like a movie, and you can tell it so well with a visual image, I'm kind of incl- inclined to think that if the artist can say the words you want, can communicate the message you want with an mm-hmm. image. I feel like that's okay. I now I don't. Yeah. It's not like I don't want to like lose my job as the writer. But if I'm writing to my <laughs> artist and this is my script, and I say his eyes say this, or his yeah. face, mm-hmm. or I, I think yeah. that that can be very moving. That can, and that can be just like I, I talked. So no introduction at movie. all. A lot no. of faces. A lot of faces going. Ooh, you know, like oh my goodness, mm-hmm. in the movie. Mm-hmm. It tells a great story. You don't need to say wow. Oh gee whiz. Oh oh my. I almost blew up. So you if come in face... blind to a book that you've never mm-hmm. read before, never seen, and there's no words. How, well, how would you it know? Can be done. It, now I'm with you. Now Bar, I'm, I'm with. Uh, I feel like the, that it it fits. Oh, first of all, I don't want to miss Paige's uh, Princess Ellen we from Black Cauldron. From yes. <laughs> we had a Black Cauldron I, reference. I, uh, knowing Paige, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if okay. Black Cauldron is one of her favorites. <laughs> And I would not, is a badger. Okay? I would not. Thank you. I would not begrudge her for loving Black, Black Cauldron, just like I love the uh, the Ralph Bakshi Lord of the Rings. Mm. So we can, as do we I. Can. As do Karen, I. First Karen, hour musical. It carries. First hour. Karen Pig um, Wanderer. Yes. Yes. Um. But but you're right, Barb. So like I, I I talked about like uh, uh Cormac McCarthy, The Road. Love it. Love that book. Short dialogue. Not a lot of description. Not needed. No Country for Old Men can't read it. It, it. I can't. I have no idea what's going on because <laughs> he doesn't say who's talking, what where they are, what the. It's just dialogue. Which, being the guy that said I love dialogue, it does not propel that book. Dialogue propels the road. Mm-hmm. And 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 so in a comic book, right, Barb, you can't you can't start it with just a minute unless unless you're going for mystery. Like you want the reader to be like a little a little mm-hmm. confused. And that's and that's a yeah. balance too. You don't want the reader to be like, what the and, you know, psh, throw the thing away. Mm-hmm. And they mm-hmm. have to there has to be just enough where there's where there's mystery and like the images drive it. And if they don't resolve it, then then they're failing. Then they're not communicating, they're not sending a message that's being received. It's you know, correctly. It's it's got to be communicated correctly. So because hey, you, 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 you would need to start somewhere like far away in the land of Wakefield land. Well, I have seen, I've seen, I have seen comics that are all pantomime throughout, throughout, not a single word of dialogue, and they do have some good ones like that. But most of the <laughs> fans know who they're, who they're is. They are coming into it. They're probably right. picking right, it up right. because it's the title of it's, Superman, Batman, Spider-Man. I mean, I've, whatever. Seen, I've seen indie comics that do do yeah. really full tough. pantomime throughout. Yeah, it's yeah. really tough, yeah. but that's yeah. when it's done well. It is really good to like, look at. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's one I want to have called Tarot that is no dialogue. And there's another one I have. Like and they're graphic loop? novels that they have no dialogue in them. Page. That can work. Loving, loving the book. Yes, movie for, for the, the memes, story. Yes. Movie for the for the memes. <laughs> it's it's right for the memes. <laughs> the, oh, and then we have. Has anyone read *Sapiens*? It's a nonfiction Non-fiction. graphic. I have not. What is uh, it? About? Good recommendation. Yes. Um, what is the topic? I can. I will look it up. I'm going to go to the. the yeah, website. go to the. Look, look it up on the interwebs. Um, one of the things intentional, cryptic dialogue or intentional cryptic storytelling are you guys into that because and don't say that it's not popular and it wouldn't work because our friend mr tarantino made tons of money doing that um in the 90s um as did a couple of other filmmakers uh who would just throw something complete it it almost like they wrote the script and then took the pages and shuffled them and shot it completely out of sequence and it became like a thing. 
to do it that way. You guys, you guys know what I'm talking about. Fiction. Yeah, Pulp Fiction's done that way. Yes. Yeah. There, there's a movie about a guy who lost his memory and he's trying to put Memento. his memory back together. Memento. Yes. Now that's yeah. that's where I think it's done, obviously, as part of the storytelling intentionally. And yeah. then you, along with the main character, put the story together. But I think a lot of times um, creators can be t- too clever for their own good. Yeah. Uh, I think in Inception is a perfect movie example of this. Um, it, you just, uh, you know, Matrix uh, Resurrections is is a mess because you just you try to watch it and go, huh, what? 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 What is, what's happening? <laughs> yeah. Um, if done well, I do enjoy it because there's like one book series I'm reading where it's time skips, like each other chapter is a time skip, but you never okay. know what time period each one is taking place in until the number of volumes in. But as you get towards those other volumes, you start to figure out, okay, this event happened before this event, and that's why this happened. And everything starts to come together in a really nice, you know, satisfying uh, ravel. Okay. Okay. So in terms of as a function of telling the story itself, I think that intentionally cryptic, mysterious approach does work. But it probably should be done by people who are very skilled they, yeah, um, it's hard at writing and, and drawing. It's you know, um when you break the rules, you, you need to be good at breaking the rules. Otherwise, it's going to be a jumbled mess. Uh, yeah. So, you know, balance, you have to know balance the rules things out. You can break them. Yeah, yeah. Look, yeah. Look at Bruce Lee, man. Look at Bruce Lee, man. He was, you know, wushu expert before he made up his own Ooh, style. Like a good wushu sauce. Yes. <laughs> you know it, man. It's good, isn't yeah, it? Delicious. On some, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> On some sashimi and uh, anyway. so. But anyway, <laughs> folks, we're. Uh, <laughs> I was, gonna, I was going to throw in that Please. type of uh, exposition you're talking about. Mm-hmm. It's actually very ancient. That's how the Pentateuch is written. And I only know mm. that because I'm taking a class. Nerd! It. <laughs> that is awesome, though, that <laughs> you bring yeah, that. It's very good. Very very good. What is the Pentateuch? Roy? The first five, five books of the Bible. Five books oh. of, the, of the Old Testament. Yeah. <laughs> the, the Torah, well, if you will. And if yes. it's written... Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. No, let me go ahead first, sorry. That it's written that you, you're not given details or specifics until the point in the story where it's important. Like when Joseph is seduced by Pharaoh's wife, you don't know what Joseph looks like. You know what he's wearing, right? The amazing technical color dream coat. Sure, sure. <laughs> know Everyone like, knows that. Yeah, right? <laughs> but it's only that moment was this, and Joseph was well built and handsome. Do so you know that Joseph is ripped and <laughs> right, quite right, nervous, right, you know? right. So, that's that's a good point. That's a good hmm. point. I mean, again, it depends on your facility with the medium, whether you're doing the art or doing the writing or both. Um, the ability to compel the reader. In in a future episode, guys, I'm going to give you a little tease here. One of the <laughs> one of the subjects we're going to get into is uh, the power of page one and how to bring in the writer. Okay, so or the reader, excuse me. So how to be compelling uh, on that first page. And I think that's that's the goal of any of us as a creator. We don't want you to throw it down and go, oh, this is too difficult or this is boring or what have you. You want the person to continue to read it and continue to look at it. So um, this is all part of our discussion today, balancing our exposition and dialogue. It has to be dependent on subject matter if you're going to break those rules, you have to have the facility with the medium in which the rules that you're breaking. Give us a good example, anybody here, free for all, a good example of your favorite kind of storytelling. It doesn't have to break the rules. It can be by the rules, but give us a graphic novel. It can be a silver line graphic novel. That would be cool. Um, but something that really just says, okay, th- these guys got it, got it right. Anybody like something memorable? Some of you just like, man, I go back to that and look at it all the time. Elf Quest. Elf Quest. Good call, Barb. She's a good storyteller. And she's the one where I got yes. the idea of having something going on in the background because mm-hmm. when she has exposition, there's so many elves, you know, and if you look in the background, they're all doing something different. They're planting mm-hmm. or, or the kids are chasing each other or, you know, the mm-hmm. dog is, the dog is, is, or the dog, the wolf. 
is pulling mm -hmm. on something he shouldn't be pulling on. There's something in every scene that's going on. You know, you've, you've got to mm -hmm. look at it two or three times to catch it all. Mm -hmm. And that's fun. Good one. Yes. Yes. Rory, anything? Oh, Anybody yeah. else? I, I, I'm still working and building my uh, comic book and graphic novel repertoire. But, I see. Uh, <laughs> as far as the great annals of literature goes, I like an epic like Beowulf. In nice. the way it's written, it, it, it's almost laid out like a like a comic or a movie frame by frame. It starts in the middle with a hero and ends with his death. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. a classic. Well, if you're going to go literary, I'll have to share my favorite. I think yes. Hamlet does oh, yeah. exactly that. It grabs you from the beginning. You know, they're celebrating a wedding, and here's the prince who's like, I'm not happy about this. I'm, I'm wearing all black. I'm sour-faced. I'm, I'm upset. My, my mom just married my uncle who I can't stand. And this is awful. This is terrible. You know, I, I, how can I even tolerate this? And so you're hooked. And so much of Hamlet, you know, not only the, the, the story is something you easily understand and get into, but then, of course, the dialogue that has become so much a part of our English lexicon from that day till today. You know, to be or not to be is still known uh, by by almost everyone as, as a rap literary reference. Where yes. Are yeah, exactly. Fun stories that pretty much read like text manuals to an extent, but are still fun to read through. I mean, Isaac Asimov had a ton of those. Like, I'm, like look at the Fantastic Voyage. He has two of them. Fantastic Voyage and Fantastic Voyage 2. Pretty much the same exact story, just one's updated with more tech, you know, more scientific information. So basically you're reading a scientific textbook based around a sci-fi story. That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, Duzlark says Hamilton. So that, another one. That is story told in metered verse, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And not just mm -hmm. poetically like... And it uh, rhymes. Shakes, right, like Shakespeare, it is sung. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Sometimes, actually, I was surprised at how well I understood it. I'm meaning like, usually a lot, when you get like a musical like that, like... Um, what was the one with um, the most recent iteration was with Johnny Depp, uh, Sweeney Todd, right? With okay. him and um, Helena Bonham Carter, right? Was she in it? She's always in those weird movies. Yeah. They sing, and it, it was written that way where they sing over each other. Oh. I couldn't understand a word they were saying. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> like, and I kept yeah. telling myself, you'll figure it out. <laughs> like, just, don't, right. don't stress about it. Don't listen too hard. Whereas Hamilton, while it was very quickly, like a lot of it was related, like very quick. I enjoyed Hamilton, and uh, the mm -hmm. the story was told really well in that song, and it was, it was very understandable. Which I know sounds silly, like I sound like an old man. I can't understand a word they're saying. But <laughs> it was it was really well done, and I, I enjoyed it. I didn't. I, I honestly went into it thinking this is gonna be dumb. Um, well, al along similar lines, uh, one of my wife's favorite musicals is uh, Little Orphan Annie, yes, and uh, she also loves. A Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory as well. Uh, so those are fun, you know, to watch. And, and you get caught up in the stories and you, you don't realize, hey, they just sang half this thing. Exposition you know? done well by Oompa Loompas, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> they, they tell you what just exactly. happened. Just and what's move that story along. <laughs> <laughs> Moves it right along. And let's not forget the classic Wizard of Oz. Oh, right? yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, so I just saw, takes you along. saw somebody put on Facebook, and I thought that, I remember thinking this when I was little. There's an orange brick road. Mm -hmm. ah. At the beginning, they spiral. Right, you know that with the very yeah. beginning they walk yeah. her over. Sure. Um in sure. The, I don't know, in the in the book, I know the movie is drastically different than the book. The book was a it is. commentary on money and robber barons and all that sort of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. is that in the book? Does anybody know that? I don't if there's an orange brick road that's specifically <laughs> orange and it's well, not just, just a, a just color a vis, correction problem. Right. problem. Just a visual <laughs> cue because yes. the yellow and the orange they spiral. I don't know. It's very odd. But yeah, those. It's interesting how you think to yourself, ah, it's a musical. I just don't think I'm going to be able to roll with this, yeah. and then you do, and it's. I felt the same way about Shakespeare until I saw Henry V uh, by Kenneth Branagh, oh, and all man. of a sudden He's I thought, you know, here's a guy who can take those those difficult verses of poetry and put it on the screen, and you're compelled. It may take you a while to get pulled in. Once you're yep. in, you're with it, you get it, you understand what's happening. So, again, visual. 
a musical I would suggest for a good um, um uh, is the Hunchback of Notre Dame. Dame, Dame or Dame, I can't, that one. Either way, that. either way. But Disney did that as a full operetta. And the yeah. thing's nice about this is the Quasimodo character. Um, they actually go with the fact that he's deaf and can't really. He's tone deaf. But the whole time, also, as he's singing, the gargoyles in the movie are doing sign language in the background behind him. So you have this nice visual element of the sign language whenever he's singing to go with the actual operetta that's being sung. Yes, I, I, I love that. Yes, I think that's that's brilliant. Um, one of the more successful ones, of course, that Disney did, The Little Mermaid, right? I mean, lots of songs there. Obviously, the latest one. Lion King, but then the latest one with the with the what, what was it the, the ice one? What is it? Frozen, frozen, oh, frozen, frozen. The yeah. uh, what? Let Brent? it go, let it go. He's here. No, no, let uh, it we, go. We don't, we don't talk about Bruno. Let uh, it go. Now above it. Did, wait, did you say something about Bruno? Parts? <laughs> what? <laughs> did you say Bruno was above Frozen? Bruno, that, like. Yes. The, 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 it's, it's at the top of the billboard charts now. You know, sold much more than Frozen's. Um, wow. Let it go did. Wait, it's basically, oh, goodness. It's basically um, the highest single they had since um, A New World from Aladdin. It's oh. their most popular song now since The New World. Wow, okay. A whole All right. New world. Yeah, mm -hmm. <laughs> can't get it right. Well, <laughs> welcome, Brent I, Larson. My How daughter, are I you, sir? That movie to death. Hi. <laughs> it's always good to see you. We we've been discussing the balance of art and dialogue and exposition, and uh, it's it's been a great convo today. But uh, we we obviously want you to weigh in as well. Um, tell us about you know Kalis has a lot of dialogue, and you put a lot of exposition in that dialogue. But I think the nature of that particular story calls. For that, um, in your mind, how do you approach it? Is it uh, content based for you? Do you have like a uh, uh, word limit in your head, like yeah, twenty five words to this panel? I, I don't really want to go over that, or 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 are you even thinking along those lines when you approach. I know because you're fairly new to comic writing, so when yeah. you got into it, did you sort of go like, how many words am I supposed to put in a panel and that sort of thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And the answer I got was. So yeah. <laughs> it's up to you. What's weird is I was even doing this literally just a couple of hours ago. I was I'm working on uh, Cape Town issue two. Mm -hmm. And what I ended up doing, frankly, was just taking. I mean, here is the Kalis, uh, you know, trade for issues one through four. So basically what I ended up doing was I literally just. Uh, chose a couple of pages that had a bunch of words and I'm like, I, I think that looks pretty good. And then I basically just uh, counted all the words from the script. And what mm -hmm. I found was um, I noticed that on pages that had a fair amount of uh, verbiage that I was hitting somewhere between, I want to say like 160 to maybe 230 words per page. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. 230, it was it was starting to look a little uh, crowded, um, mm -hmm. and so what I what I'm starting to do now is just try to get a word count and try to hit that sweet spot for me, which would probably be somewhere around 200 words. And um, now I wrote the script for uh, every script I've written for Kalis has actually been a panel by panel action description. But as Justin and I are working on the second issue, uh, I'm trying to actually kind of let him speak more into what the panel design is going to look like, which is interesting because I've never really worked with that before. So instead, what I'm doing is I'm just basically trying to figure out what it is I want them to say. And hopefully, uh, you know, I can still stay within that word count, uh, hopefully fairly easily. But uh, it's going to be a new a new experience, but that's largely what I do. Well, that's interesting. Do you use, I mentioned earlier in, in the show that uh, I'm using uh, final draft 12. They have a graphic novel template no. No. and uh, yeah. And it was interesting as you, as you, one of the graphic novel templates, you open it up and I'm using that one and it tells you like, 
Uh, it's recommended that you use between 25 and 35 words per panel, which I thought was interesting because I'd never, not being a writer, uh, you know, I never really thought about word count uh, per panel. Hmm. But uh, it's it's interesting. Do you use that? Do you use just Word or do you use Final Draft for your comics as well? I know you use it for the other, but I do. I had no idea there was a graphic uh, novel um, template. template. In- That's great. I might check yeah. that out. Uh, really, what I use is Google Docs because it's okay. easy to share and comment mm-hmm. on. And since I try to get several people to uh, critique um, my stuff when I when I um, finish a draft, it's really easy to share it with them and then get their, their critiques back um, without having to deal with saving versions of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, when when you're working with your artist, do you say, I mean, in terms of uh, making room for the dialogue and so on, do you work closely or do they just get it and go, oh, my gosh, where, how am I going to make room for all this talking? I think what they probably do <laughs> is uh, at least Lewis uh, for Kalis probably tries to be mindful of it. But he'll just draw it and then I'll look at it and go, holy crap, look, who is this wordy jerk? And, <laughs> and then I realize, oh, I'd better knock out. 25% of the whole thing. And I find that, well, it can be done mostly. So mm-hmm. I'm a writer. I just love me some words. <laughs> you love you some words. Son. <laughs> yeah, so. Brent, I, I, I find that I, I, I overwrite and I have found um, I, I, I provide it all to the artist and, and Rory and I hash out what they're going to say. And we do, we do overwrite, but then once you get the pictures back, uh, I, you can, you can readjust, you can trim down and you can realize like we had said before, that an expression, well, that just said a lot more than all those words. So I'm gonna have them say either you know, huh, or no, or wow, or you know, <laughs> or take it all out. Bad. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> take it all out. And I, 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 I overwrite, and I, I have found oh, in my illustrious career uh, that trimming it, <laughs> I can, I'm easy, it's easy to trim it down, mm-hmm. and then and paste it a little better once I have the final or close to final images. That's just been my experience. Actually, Less in every more. medium, in every writing medium, that's what they say. Yeah, Everybody you know, overwrites. Right. It's the natural inclination. Yeah. And you kind of can see why. I mean, I can't mm-hmm. draw my way out of a paper bag, but right, I can same. talk all <laughs> day. <laughs> and I yeah. will. And, but nobody's going to want to read that. Right. So what right. you got to do is find that sweet spot. So mm-hmm. Yeah, and we, we were talking about reading it out loud. I really, really like to read it out loud because then yeah. you can you can find a find a break, a pause, chop a word out, have somebody talk over the other person, you interrupt. Uh, so saying it out loud because sometimes you read it out what you wrote out loud, you're like, no one talks like that. No, <laughs> no one would ever say that. Exactly. Brent, another quick question for you. How many times, how many drafts of a page do you usually take before you say okay that's it or do you just like that's it first first pass well what i usually do this is what i've done in the past especially with kalis it's what i've had the most experience on i i start with just a vague idea of what the story is then i will uh sharpen it to all the plot points i want to hit then I'll drill it down to how many, you know, I have 22 pages. So what happens on so many pages, like every a scene will be two pages or three pages typically. And then I'll start to break it down into panels. And then I'll actually script a page and I'll realize, um, okay, in order to convey everything I wanted, I'll probably <laughs> need seven, well, at least six or seven panels. I'll script out what will turn out to be nine. Yeah. And then I'll have to see where I can cut to dial it back and fit it into those seven panels. Some are, I mean, Tom King is, he's the guy who loves the nine panel, you know, bump, 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 bump. And um, I guess it works for him. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I'm not nearly that confident. So <laughs> it worked. Hey, it worked in Watchmen. So, you know, yeah, so, yeah, you know, 
Um, it can work. It depends on the type of story you're telling. A lot of people want to freeze the window to a single size so that you're not distracted by any sort of fancy layouts and breaking out of the borders and panels and silhouettes and all of that, you know, all the, all the 90s stuff that inspired me to be an artist. But I understand that if you're going to want people just to focus on the story more so than the art, that, you know, containing and isolating and freezing it to that one panel size it can make sense and certainly is appropriate for, for certain stories. Uh, if, if you're going to go super intellectual too, like, you know, or super literate, like Watchmen, you know, mm-hmm. um, what's funny think- is I've had so many people say, Kalis, it's so great, man. The art is amazing. And I'm like, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what I'm realizing is, you know, Maybe it would be okay if um, I, I kind of secede some of my control and let the artist actually get to do some freaky stuff. And whenever I see Lewis uh, or Justin on Cape Town go crazy, uh, it's always for the better. I'm just like, wow, these guys know what they're doing. I had no idea. And so <laughs> yeah. what I then do is I try to then take the words and bend them around a little more. And yeah. thing, Which yeah. it can be done. So mm-hmm. why not? Mm-hmm. Anyone, anyone who's ever going to say, "I can't believe how they're butchering my foot," <laughs> like, "Shut up, dude!" It's comic. Comics are great. I love them, and they can be really, really good. But there is some artistry involved, and by artistry, I mean drawing stuff, which mm-hmm. I don't know how to do. Now, when, what? when I was writing my script, I ran this issue where I decided to give all, most freedom to the artist to decide what to do. Then I get playing saying, you're not being, too, you need more detail. And they started, the artist started telling me to do as many minute descriptions as I can, like how the entire room was laid out, what furniture was and everything. Mm. So I had the opposite problem where basically the artist wanted me to just tell them everything and where to place everything. Yeah. Yes, usually the collaboration, Jeremy, is, is um, it depends on the type of artist you're dealing with. Like yeah. for me, you can just say, you know, uh, formal living room, Victorian. Yeah, and that's really it. Yeah. I'll, I'll know where to go and get the reference, and so on and so forth. Um, and and to your point, Brent, earlier uh, I, I brought up tension and release. Like, if you wanted to do a heavy dialogue, heavy exposition page, and then it's followed by a splash or even a double splash, where there's like no dialogue it's like okay the spaceship explodes right and that's that's the scene so again you've built up this tension by talking a lot and then you get this breath of just the art you take a breath and then we go back into more more of the the dialogue and the text so you know again you look at it like a like almost like a symphony it's like music you know you 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 want the yeah you you can do like i said earlier yeah Fight next four pages. Yep. <laughs> fight yeah. next four yeah, pages. Yeah. Right. Yeah. right. They fight. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They I love that. Fight. I like that. I don't know. I believe in a double <laughs> spread that doesn't have any words. I I think that would annoy the heck out of me. <laughs> oh, you'd love it, man. It's been you right. love it. Wait, wait till you see Steam Pages. Wait till you see issue number it, two, man. dude. There's all no right. words. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's all it's all eyes. Yeah, with goggles, <laughs> it's all reflections. <laughs> it's all you get. Well, the good thing Just about imagine. having a lot of dialogue sometimes is the artist doesn't have to draw us underneath there. Mm. Doesn't have to do right. what? Uh, well, when you have a lot of dialogue on a page, oh, the yeah. artist doesn't have to pay attention <laughs> to those. Yeah. yeah, you can leave it if you if you put the dialogue over right over hands, right? Yep. <laughs> it doesn't have to draw the hands. Yeah. Right. That's oh what it, like, you would pay more well, for no, hands, that's, right? That's Hence the, the hand behind the back or the. Yep. Oh <laughs> yeah. Because I think Roland would say, you know, quick and dirty. You know, you should have detail on certain scenes, but in between, just move it along. Well, so we learned our lesson. So detailed. Yeah, we learned our lesson as artists cutting our teeth in the '90s. And a Robin, uh, <laughs> you and I talk about this forever. But you'd spend all this time drawing, you know, the Colosseum with all the characters in it, and then you get it back, and the letters covered all of your painstakingly put together perspective and all the 
extras up in the stands throwing their hands up and holding up signs and pom poms and all that. And so, you know, you learn to talk to the writer and go, Hey man, you know, how, how, how much dialogue are we talking here in this shop? Because I could spend 12 hours on this background or I could spend about three and, and yeah. get the same point across, you know? Mm. Um, what about you, Rob? Did you like when you were working on Star Trek, um, did you know, at the time, like how much dialogue was going to be in the scene? Like when you were drawing, like, okay, yeah. this is going to take place on the bridge. How much of the bridge am I going to have to like draw? Am I going to draw the whole bridge and then half of it's going to be covered over it in, in talk balloons? Well, um, it, it was, it was done full script. So you knew how much dialogue or how much okay, good. How big the caption was going to be. But uh, so you had it, you had an idea. They, they usually broke it down. There's five panels on this page. It didn't tell you right. new two at the top. You know, you had sure, some, you had sure. some room to be creative. Uh, so what you would what you would try to do, and what I tell people who are learning how to tell stories in comic books is, uh, on the first panel, that's where you put all your detail. That's where you put where everything is in the room that's going to be dealt with on the next five or six panels or the next two pages. So you do all the detail in the first one. Then from there on, you can draw just the people interacting and leave the background blank for them to put mm -hmm. the bird balloons into. Mm -hmm. So hopefully mm -hmm. your, your writer thinks that way too. Set the scene, make that a big panel, you know, just a little bit of dialogue is to get it, to get it started. And then mm -hmm. you throw all the other stuff in uh, later on in the panels where, where the artist doesn't have to show every detail in the panel. Yeah, yep. I, agree. Claremont. I agree. Claremont, yeah. <laughs> Claremont, that's, notorious for being wordy, and it worked well for the X-Men. That's, yes, that's, it it's important John to work Burton with. crazy, but yeah. Yeah, with the writer and, and talk to him. You know, that that's one thing I've, I've learned to do over the years is talk to your collaborator a lot and talk about it as get as granular as you want to about the page, you know, and, and yeah. that way yeah. you can save a lot of time. Uh, and and it works and vice versa too. There's a lot of times when I, when I will look at um, uh, something that was penciled or, or inked, and I'm not understanding what's going on on this page. So I will call the writer, and like, or email them, and, and they say, "What is supposed to be happening in this panel right here?" Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and they'll tell me, "You don't like, get the okay. script." Well, don't sometimes get the script? I don't. Not always. Oh, I w if I were inkered, I want the script so I could get all the all the details right. Well, I do. And if necessary, I, I, add some in. Yeah, so I do. I yeah. do get the script sometimes, but there are, well, mm. well for instance, I'm, I'm redoing well, um, sirens job. right now. I'm coloring sirens. And this was a, a black and white book that was done way back in the nineties. There is no script left. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm having it's to guess. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm having to guess. Is this, is this some kind of formula? Is this blood they're pouring into the water? What is this? You know? um, so is I have ooze? To, Yeah. So I need to get the answers most responsibly. <laughs> Tommy says, good to see everybody. Full Hi, Tommy. house. Yes, it is. Tommy. How you doing, man? Here, Tommy will be at Fuller House. Miss you. Yeah. yeah. Love you. W Wubba says, let an artist go free. You'll have a happy artist. Oh, yeah, that is true. Free. That is true. Like fire or or as free oh, as the world. Yeah. <laughs> you make, you so make this artist happy by giving him a good, fun story to, to tell. Yeah. yeah. Tell I, I, it, yeah. If, I, if I have a good story, man, I can, I can layer stuff. I can, you know, I can... I know what's going to, if I've read the whole script, which I should, which every artist should, you know what's mm -hmm. coming so you can foreshadow stuff in the art uh, that may not even be in the script. So, yeah, if, you, if you've got a good story, uh, you're inspired to really take it to the, to the next level. I, so, yeah. I, had some, I had some fun with one artist I had from one of the comics I wrote. Since I, want, I, want to, I love the style. I want them to work for me. So I wrote an entire three pages of my script that's basically just a parody of one of the comics he wrote, worked on previously. <laughs> and then I showed him that specific sample from the script, and that's what cooked him in. That's uh -huh. awesome. Very nice. That's awesome. Very nice. What, what hooks Tommy in is no dialogue, all, all sound all effects. Yes. That's, <laughs> that's what yeah. hooks Tommy. Man, after my own heart. <laughs> Bubba says, I just leave the room for the balloons best I can, as, yeah. as do I, Wubba. That's... That's what that's I do as well. Yeah, that's all you can yep. do. Yeah, 
Um, Tommy says several times during my nightman run asked for the script. I didn't know if it was day or night. Couldn't tell from the pencils. That's yeah. Right. Sometimes you can. Yeah. yeah sometimes. I don't know. Yeah. Was, well, it was night. So you that's cold. Yeah. Yeah. Night. The script. Because mm-hmm. it's Nightman, so you know it's a Nightman script, right? So obviously, <laughs> you it takes place. Sometimes darker shadow or lighter. Sometimes shadow. you don't. <laughs> I was working off this one right? for coloring once, and there was constant time skips throughout the um, entire page, all the pages I was working on. But the script never said when a time skip was, and it, so he never knew if the character changed clothes or not. And there's another. Like, there's whole pan- panels where um, the writer. Accidentally wrote a character in that wasn't even that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place, <laughs> so the script was referring to people who weren't even in the panel. <laughs> oh God, <laughs> bizarre! Yeah, I well, guys, this, this is this. Oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, make this guy purple, always purple, and then everybody always, always purple, <laughs> and it always works. Um, I usually this is the point of the show where we want to bring in a little discussion on on pop culture. I don't want to don't want to do any spoilers. Has uh, has everyone seen? Book of Bubba Fett, episodes five and no. six. No. Yep. I, I don't no. get Disney Plus. No. I'm I don't get Disney okay. sorry. Uh, sorry. I'm behind. I'm behind on everything. Behind, rise behind. So, so in the interest of being spoiler-free, I'll skip it. Other than to say this, the spoiler-free review, number one, episode five is awesome. Okay. It's actually <laughs> Mandalorian episode one of season three. That's basically what episode five is. I've been, seeing that on Facebook. I've been seeing that on Facebook. Yeah, it's too. fantastic. It really is good. And there's some there's some <laughs> elements in it that call back to a lot of the animated uh, series. Uh, and I don't really? want to go too far okay. into that. Yes, cool. uh, the Clone Wars series. So. You guys who are fans of Clone Wars mm-hmm. will absolutely love the references there. Um, and episode six, um, I just I don't want to give it away, but those fans that are uh, fans of the original trilogy are going to go nuts on that one too. I saw so, for that, so I know what you're talking oh, about. you did. Okay, well, like I said, let's I just hang say out on Tumblr, which is <laughs> okay. Mm. It's it's better than you expect. Let's let's just put it that way. Um, okay. Is it as any, good as the low speed car chase in episode three? Mm, I don't know if anything Ooh, quite reaches speed. the low speed car chase in episode three. <laughs> Woo, was shot. it a white Bronco? <laughs> <laughs> Practically, wow. actually, it wow, looked good, like uh, it looked like reference. a car chase with half the half of the cars were actually like rascals. Yeah. And uh, you're like, they're chasing this one guy, and you're just like, dude, you could get out and run faster than this. <laughs> and then Boba Fett jumps on his Bantha and starts walking across the desert, <laughs> and you're like, at this rate, he will still be doing this in episode six. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I haven't reconciled that yet. So you haven't seen it either, Brent? I just uh, saw the first three episodes. Everyone tells me it gets better, which I am thankful for. Because five, five is the guy. turning point. Yeah. All, yeah. all I'm going to say, five is the turning point. Because um, I was, I was nonplussed with one through three as well. I was like, meh, you know. Yeah. And I rarely say like meh. So now it's you're like a lot of hear, story. I'm hearing this a really lot. Gruntled. Three <laughs> shows like this that. Well, the first three were really meh, but it got better by five. You know, if a TV show back in in the in the day when when we didn't stream had that kind of stuff, people would have given up by issue by oh, yeah. the Star second Trek. episode. Next Whereas generation. now we've got mm. you know we've got four four mm. episodes before anything important happens, and I'm going. It, 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 I keep hearing this, and I'm going, why would I want to watch the first four episodes? <laughs> then let me jump in on episode five. It's, I can catch if up. If you did, you know what, Rob? If you did jump in on episode five, you would not be upset, and you would yeah. not be disappointed yeah. at all. You'd be like, dude. So, you know? Yeah. I literally so said go. dude after. I mean, I was in, <laughs> watching it by myself. And stood up and was like, dude. And then I looked around and was embarrassed. 
I want it too. <laughs> it, it, it was that good. Yeah, it was, huh. it was that good. I just keep okay. thinking the Disney Plus executives, they've been watching me through Facebook or whatever, so they already know everything that I feel about Marvel and Star Wars. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> we don't want to hear your complaints. Cash <laughs> or we will raise it yet again. Again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, how brilliant and insidious is the subscription model? I mean, you know, it's like, Oh, you know, it's 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 um, not the liberty liberty only pay for what you need, right? Nope. No, no, no. Mm. It's it's you're gonna pay whether you want it or not. Right? <laughs> I, I that's it why went, I don't have Disney Plus. Yeah, Actually, I have a son who has why I have a son who has two kids, uh, two very small ones. So he has Disney Plus, and I get mm. I get the other. See, yeah, yeah, the 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 what's that, Jeremy? Jer- Jeremy's jumping here. The proper way to do subscriptions is you only subscribe to watch the show you want. Once you've been through the whole thing, you cancel the subscription and jump onto a different platform. You yes. Wait until- then why not sell it a la carte? That's what they should have done with cable like 40 years ago. Yeah, yeah right. Why not but, do it like that is then you have but, to so, remember. And but that's cable my problem. Has the, um, cable has those uh, fees you have to charge when you cancel. Subscription services that's do how not. They get you. That's the difference. That's how they no, get I, you. You know, I want to. I want to be able to buy, uh, and I did this with the, the Perry Mason, new, new mm-hmm. Perry Mason. I'm a huge Perry Mason fan. I, mm-hmm. I, I, I've shared. I've shared the fact that my my day begins and ends with Perry Mason episodes. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, but I watched. I watched the new Perry Mason because I bought it on iTunes after it had been out for a while, and it came out, and it was so I paid for it then. Uh, and I could buy the first one and go, okay, I kind of like it. So I, I, and then I could buy the whole season. But mm-hmm. uh, but this whole bit of paying twelve ninety nine a month uh, for for all this stuff that I probably won't watch. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. net, Netflix is about as far as I go because I get I get my money's worth out of Netflix. Oh yeah, and Good. yeah. Good. So I, I, don't pay for I that use that. My watch. My wife watches it every day. So. <laughs> And we share that one with our daughter, and she yeah. shares Hulu with us. So, oh yes, there's a lot of that, so that trading we be revealing this? Yeah. creds well, going. On. Yeah, right. So this is online for everybody to see, right? <laughs> so it's like, yeah. Facebook execs yeah, are watching no Brent. Subscription for this. Hulu's yeah. watching us. <laughs> Hulu's watching. Going, uh huh. These guys <laughs> right Rob here. Davis. Oh, Rob they Davis. Do. Got Got Look, I don't kids. even know these people. Hulu. You okay, can, you I, allow I, your family just to use your your access. You yeah. can access up to three or four, I think. Yeah. Right. So, and my kids yeah. take care of the old folks. You know. Yeah. Well, yeah. You do, that's what I did. I well, my e changer and get the physical media put it there. Yeah, my son gets his Disney Plus from his in laws. So that's I and I don't and nobody else in the family has got. Disney Plus, so I can't share that one with anyone. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. and and it's almost reached critical mass where it might be that where there's enough stuff on there I might want to watch that it it might uh, it might actually reach that point at some point. But then there's the I'm a big Star Trek fan, but I don't mm-hmm. you know I don't have that subscription either. So yeah, it, well I, if you share too thing. many credentials, you'll get the phone call. Mr. Davis, it seems that you have exceeded your sharing credentials. Then tr- you know, then you sh- never know. Off and I'll stop paying you. <laughs> <laughs> easy, easy answer. I'll go back to this broadcast. Or right. DVD. Well, I, you know, I back up I got everything a with DVD collection. Oh yeah, I back up everything with a physical copy anyway. Right. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. yeah, a friend of mine said. Uh, why are you buying Dune on Blu-ray? I mean, you just watch it on HBO Max anytime you want. And I'm like, until they take it until off. They take it away. HBO, HBO Max. And then, or they raise you know, it where I can't afford it anymore. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I'm a big hard copy case. Um, okay, so goes down the crapper and then... We're just preppers, man. We're preppers. We're, we're hanging on to all that stuff. I want it physically, man. I, I just want to hold no. it, okay? I want to hold it. 
I just want to tell everybody I was right. I think that's what I'm waiting for. Of course. Yeah. Of course. Brent was right. We're all going to do that all simultaneously. Brent was right. Brent. Now that's a name now. Brent was right. Oh, gosh. Look at at what Richard Dunn says here. This is is good. Go back to the BMG Music Forum and buy 10 CDs for a penny and then promise to purchase 10 more programs over the next year. Yeah. And never remember to cancel that subscription. (laughs) And then they show up. (laughs) <laughs> they just show it. You're like, what? what? They're no, gonna charge me for this. 227. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> God, Madonna of- again? Oh. <laughs> Do you remember that episode yeah. of The Simpsons where Homer's like, "I joined that music club. Ten albums for a penny. Yeah. And they jacked up the price. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Marge. <laughs> Oh, guys, well, that brings us to the end of the broadcast. I really appreciate you guys being here and everybody that was watching. We had a great, great show. And uh, we're going to close with a really good show. We're going to close with our new closing bumper, guys. So uh, here we go without without. Hey, I'm Alex Savio, and I just want to let you know, make mine civilized.